Welcome as you're joining. Okay, we'll start in another one minute. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, rather. Thank you for having me today. And as always, my name is Ridwan Salahuddin. I'm excited to be taking you today, as always. So today we shall be discussing more about pandas. So we are on item four on the table of contents. So as usual, we're going to start with a recap of uh, the last class. So in the last class, we, we discussed extensively about reading files from different sources, such as Excel, CSV, JSON and HTML using the pd.read, uh, read basically any of these uh, file types. Okay, so in this recap, we'll be making use of uh, California housing prices data sets to showcase some of the things, or to, to remind ourselves of some of the things we learned yesterday. Okay, so as usual, I have the directory leading to the file here. So, and I proceed it with um, an R. So this is to avoid Unicode error. All right, so I'll run this. In the meantime, I think I should clear my kernel so the output of the previous run doesn't show. Okay, clear. Okay, good. So I'm starting all over. So there we go. So this is the California housing data set, read in as a CSV file that it is. If this um, were to be other file types would we'll simply substitute CSV here with, for instance, Excel or JSON or HTML when you're reading from the web. Okay, so we discussed slicing columns and rows uh, using mask to slice rows as well. All right, so I'm just going to show example of uh, the two slicing columns and slicing rows. So we're starting with slicing columns. So here, the, the 
aim is to display the total rooms and household columns. So let's go back to the data set. So we have total rooms column here and we have households here as well. So we want to display just those two columns out of this table of data that we have. All right, so I'll run this and there it is. So we have it showing the entire 17,000 rows of records and two columns as we specified. So in the next example, or in the next recap here, all right, so we are going to um, do something for that to so what we have done here. So what we have done here is just to slice two columns out of the table. So here we want to slice the rows. We don't want all the 17,000 rows returned. Instead, we want um, rows that meet certain condition or certain conditions as the case may be. But in this example, we have just one condition. In the, um, in the main class yesterday, we showed how to combine multiple conditions. So here we want um, records that have housing, housing median age greater than 15. So let's go to the table once again. This is housing median age column. So any record that has the value here greater than 15 will get returned. So automatically this will not be returned while this will be, this will be returned, this will not be, this will be returned and so on and so forth. So to do it in uh, a very efficient way, so we, we let pandas handle it first. So I'll run this and uh, so there it is. We can see that some records are skipped. We don't have um, zero, we don't have Three. We don't. Uh, we don't have. All right, but we don't have many more in between. This shows that there is there are some records in between. So it shows the top five and the bottom five records. All right. Then we also uh, discussed creating plots. So in this recap, we'll see how to create scatter plots. So we discussed that we could create plots by simply calling df.plot and um, there's an argument in it. So what I'm talking, what I'm explaining is not this, I'm explaining the way we did it yesterday. So this is yet another way it can be done. So yesterday we didn't do it this way. So instead of having this scatter here, no, we instead just, I'll cut this off. So we instead just have something like this and um, the kind, there's a kind argument that it accepts. So we'll pass in scatter. And it's going to give us what we um, desire. So uh, we also have to specify the column names. I mean, the x, x axis and y axis, since it's, it's a x by y axis plot. So uh, there's an x argument it takes that we probably have to, um, that we definitely have to specify. So uh, since it has been implemented in a different way, I'll just let that prevail here. So here we have its plots. We call the scatter argument, the scatter method, and we pass in x, y, and um, let's see it. It's taking longer than expected. Okay, so there it is. We can see our nice scatter plot. So um, this record, for instance, for uh, on the um, household column, it's fall around 6,000, or it has a value of around 6,000. And the same record corresponds to around 3,200 um, in total rooms column, All right? Okay, so that's the um, recap of yesterday's class. Um, before we go into today's class, can everybody hear me? It's, yes. All right, thank you. Um, 
you just the only one I have here though. Okay. So, uh, before we go on to today's class, I am going to share a quiz with, with you to attempt. So, we're going to have, so I'm going to send it as a chat. Okay, so there it is. Please confirm if you can see it. Yes, I've seen it. All right, all right. So you should round that up in one or two minutes. So by 5.13, we We'll carry on with the class. Okay, sir. Okay, we should continue. All right. So uh, today we'll, we're discussing more on pandas, manipulating data frames. So uh, we have six items here that we'll try to cover in the next 45 minutes. And they are, we're going to take them sequentially. All right, so we're starting with creating new columns derived from existing columns, then renaming columns. Okay. So uh, as usual, we we're working with um, the earlier mentioned data set, the California housing data set. So we read it in and next okay so uh, let's try to create a, a new column which is the number of people per household so let's look at the data frame first so we'll see that um, we have um, a column that tells us the population of people within uh, a particular area or longitude uh, a particular coordinate so it gives us the population of people there. Then it also gives us the uh, 
um, number of households there. So now, say we want to know on average how many people per household. How many people per household? So if you want to compute this for um, the entire records, the entire yeah records of population. So we will simply do this. I'm dividing the population column by the household column, and I'm assigning it to a new variable population per household. All right. So let's see it. So there it is. Here, notice we had. Um, how many columns? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine columns. And here we have one more, which is a population per household. That is here. So now let's also try to rename columns. So Pandas allows us to change the names of columns. So say for some reasons you maybe the, the, the data set you read in has um, names that are not intuitive, not easy to remember, and you want to make your analysis easy. So you don't want to struggle with knowing what um, a column means. So you want to redescribe each column as you will understand. All right, so it, uh, Pandas allows you to rename the columns. So you will have to, so if you want to, if you want to rename, pass, um, call the rename method, on the entire data frame, then you have to pass in the column names, the original column names, and the corresponding or the new column name you want to change it to as a key value pair in a dictionary or as a dictionary simply. So as a dictionary. So here I'm creating a dictionary whose key is the actual name of the column and the value is the new name I want it to be. So here, median house value, I'm changing it to med house val. So and the other column I'm changing is the population per household, the new column we just created. Uh, we're changing it to pop per house. So not just allowing us to change columns, we can as well change um, indexed names. So index names can also be changed. So let's come here and see. If you do not specify um, an, a different index at the point of reading in your data set, so pandas automatically assigns um, a, a sequential index that ranges from zero to um, one less than the number of items or the number of records in your data frame. So it just assigns arbitrary zero, one, two, three, as many as as many records as to have in data frame. All right. So here we want to rename index zero to zero zero and index one to one one in the in the row axis. So these two will be um, done in one uh, one move. So these are data frame. So simply call the rename method on the data frame and pass in the columns, um, a columns uh, argument as the one the, the dictionary created for it and the index arguments to be the uh, dictionary we created for the index new names as well. So let's run this and see what we get. All right, so let's examine it. So here we, we have med house val having replaced median house value and here pop per house having replaced population per household. And so if we look at the row axis, so we see zero has been replaced with zero, zero and one has been replaced with one, one. Although this doesn't make um, any sense for most analysis. So I, it was just for um, illustration. So uh, I didn't I didn't save it to a new data frame, so we won't be using it uh, going forward. Okay, so indexing indexing with lock and i lock and um, reindexing with reindex. Okay, so. I just realized that I, I forgot to 
um, add examples of indexing with re-index. So but we're going to take it um, nonetheless. Okay, so here, um, this example say, lock only supports indexing by name. So if you want to index, if you want to uh, index your data frame using lock, whether your data frame or your series, Panda series, using lock, you will have to pass in the names you want to return as list. So here we say df.log and we want index zero, index one, two, five, seven, ten from this data frame returned. And we want just two columns, column latitude and column longitude. And we call them by name. So that is lock. That's what actually differentiates from what you'll be seeing next, the I lock. So let's run this. So rightly, we have just the um, index records that we've listed, and we have just two columns that we also listed. However, um, in contrast to lock, I lock, which um, you can intuitively call it index location. So it, it's, it uses the index, the sequence index of um, each axis to um, locates it. So in, in this example, um, we want, okay, so it's, it, might, it, might, it might not make much sense because um, the data frame we're making use of, if you observe, the index um, is zeros to the number of items we have in the data frame. Basically, the, the index name corresponds to the index location as well to the sequential index so the this one with index zero for instance with index name zero is also at index location zero this one with index name one is at location one so that's the point i'm making but we could instead have this index here to be um, some values that we got from the data frame for instance or maybe date time. Yeah, we could just get it from the data frame. So and when we have such, um, we, we have the liberty um, to, or uh, we, we will be able to see um, the difference I'm, I'm trying to highlight between iLock and lock more clearly. So here, just take it that this is only referring to the index location, like as the way when you have a list of when you have a list of numbers, you could say, for instance, assuming, let's look at this list here. So latitude is at index location zero, longitude is at index location one. If instead, this is just zero and one, instead of we have latitude and longitude, if we had just zero and one. Zero will be at index location zero, and one will be at index location one. That's the point I'm trying to clarify. All right, so um, we run this and we get this, and Okay, so in this example, yeah. So this, we are using the index location. So we want index location four, five, six on the row axis and index or columns at index seven, three, six, nine. So in this order, let's run it. And if we see it, so median income, if we check the original table, Median income is somewhere around here at index location seven. Total rooms should be at index location three. Total rooms at index location three and the others two. All right. So, uh, okay, yeah, I said I didn't include examples of re-index. So I'm going to quickly take that. Example three, re-index. So what makes re-indexing different from, uh, what makes re-indexing different from lock and I-lock? 
Okay, I'm, I'm trying to see. Because they, they almost do the same thing. But nonetheless, there's still a subtle difference. Well, I, I can't really remember here. So let's just um, Google it. And reindex. Oh, I can't find. Okay, I, I think we can be saved by the pandas documentation library. So let's pandas. Let's try to have it answered before moving on. Uh, it's not, I can't find it here. Try I look. Okay, yeah, I've, I've, I've got it. Okay, so um, in in in. Um, using iLog, for instance, if we were to try to access an index, an index location that is greater than the, that is out of bound. Being out of bound means um, maybe the max index is at index nine, and we're trying to access index 10 or 11 or anything beyond it. So let's try index 12. So we're definitely going to get an error here. So yeah, we get an error, positional indexes out of bound. However, um, we, can, we can do this with um, re-index. So if, if we also try this with lock to and passing a column name or an index, um, a row name or index name that is not existing on the data frame. So we're going to get an error. However, with reindex with reindex method, that is avoided. This error is avoided. Let's see df dot df dot reindex. So df dot dot reindex. So we will pass in our column our um, labels. So the labels we want to re-index. My system is behaving. Oh, don't, cr don't crash, please. Okay, good. Okay, so. So say we want um, index two, index five. So we'll run this and we get items at index two and five. So if we want more, we'll pass it in 
the 12, well, let's pass in 99999. So 9999999 is obviously bigger than the number of items we have. So what it simply does, it still returns 99999, but it fills it with none. So instead of throwing up um, an error, an exception, it creates that item you, I mean, the index name you try to access and uh, it fills it up with um, none values. Okay, so uh, how about the column axis? So let's say columns. It is like the, let, let's call this index actually. So columns, so let's say we want just housing median age and uh total bedrooms yeah yeah so uh, there we go so let's try um something wild so we try three three is obviously not a name in the table so it returns none for us in three so similarly here if we add um say x so we're still going to get something similar so x is filled with nouns here so this is what index allows us to do so it allows us to do what we can do with the lock method but it avoids throwing error as in the case of um, lock okay Now, uh, we will pause here and resume back um, immediately. Oh, there's a 30, um, excuse me. Okay, we are not more than three. I think we're just three in the, in the chat, um, in the uh, meeting. I think we yes. can exceed um, the 40 minutes um, barrier. Although I've been notified. So I'll just ride on and wait if we get disconnected. So let's be sure to join back with the same link. So if we get disconnected, okay. let's join back with the same link. All right. So calculating summary statistics. Okay, so uh, Pandas allows us to calculate summary statistics of our data frame, so various summary statistics. So in the first example here, let's see how to calculate the mean of um, a column. So DF the population, so this population column wants to get a mean value of population or the mean population, I'm just the mean population of the data set. So it's 1,429.57 and many other values afterwards. So we can as well calculate the standard deviation by calling this STD method. And um, that gives us 1,147. It shows that uh, the, the variation in the values is quite high. Okay. So, uh, however, Pandas allows us um, to just, uh, oh, it, it, it has a very nice method that returns um, some, most of the useful statistics of our data frame. So in the, instead of doing this one after the other for each column, assuming you want to get these statistics for um, all the columns. So instead of doing this one after the other, um, Pandas has this describe method that's does that on all the columns that are numerical columns and returns um, and the, uh, returns the statistics for us. All right, it returns it to us. Let's see it. So here counts, here we have mean, standard deviation, then mean 
which is the minimum. Then the first quartile, um, the, the median or the second quartile, you call it. And here the third quartile. And uh, this is the, the max, this is the max value. So now for each of the, for each of the columns, we get these statistics. So we can see all the columns have count of 1,007, I mean 17,000 records, which is um, intuitive since the data frame has 17,000 records. So how about the mean? Now, longitude has a mean of 119.568. Although this doesn't make sense because nobody's going to be calculating the mean of longitude in any analysis. So latitude 35 as well, nobody's going to be calculating the mean. Then housing median, yeah, so this will make sense. We want to know the median value of housing median age. So the median age. So this tells us that um, the, we have good number of people below 20, 28 and a good number of people above 28. So, so this that's the middle of our, okay, sorry, it's mean, I beg your pardon. It's mean, I'm looking at mean, not median. So mean value of 28. So uh, the average of the population is 28.5589 and so on and so forth for the other columns. All right. So next we will discuss sorting a data frame, sorting a data frame. So we can sort a data frame by column or even by columns. So you, we have um, our California data frame still, our California data set. Now, assuming we want to arrange the records in ascending order by the order of, or by the size of the population. So we'll simply call df.sort. So we call the sort values method on it. So let's see it. So if you look at the index, the index should give you the indication that this table has been um, sorted. Because instead of being in the um, chronological order of 0, 1, 2, 3, or uh, the progressive order of 0, 1, 2, 3, sequential order, I think that is right. So instead of being the sequential order of 0, 1, 2, 3, and on and on. So we have it really mixed up here. So because we have sorted it by the um, order of the population. So here we have the minimum population of three. So we have an area in um, California that has just population of three, just three people living there. So I, I imagine that it's just going to be a deserted place where um, somebody who just wants to live out of sight of everyone just chose to um, build his um, apartment there and live in. So, so we have three, six, and on, and you can see the largest. So we, we have an area with population of 35,682. Yeah. So in the, uh, in the next example, we'll see how to group by multiple columns. So in this, we're trying to group by population and total rooms. So now, a potential conflict which has been dealt with is and we are grouping by population and total rooms, which should take precedence. So which should you group by first before considering the other? So Spanda simply um, makes use of the order of appearance of um, the list of columns. So it's groups by population first. So you're sure that your table or your data frame is going to be in order of population from lowest to the biggest. Then um, it's now going to group by total rooms. So for instance, if you have a population of, uh, say a population of 20 and there are several, several um, records that have population of 20, now, all those records with population of 20 will now be grouped by the order of the total rooms in those records. Okay. 
So move. Welcome back. So we'll be discussing combining data frames. So data frames can be combined in a number of ways in, in Pandas. So um, you can think of combining data frame. Okay, let's say we have, say you have, um, you, you're getting records from a, a department in your organization and you're getting another set of the records from another department. So now the records have the same fields, same columns. However, there are some of them that are domiciled with one department and other records are domiciled with the other department. So you would want, in order to analyze or to make use of this data, if you get it from the two of them, you'd want to join them at the base. So join one to the base of another, so you can have the full record. So it's just like you have half line with one department and the other half with the other department. So in that case, you'll think of it as maybe a, a concat um, com, com, combination of um, data frames. So you want to concat it along the row axis. So however, yeah, if, even though I, I just mentioned concat, which is one of the methods that pandas supports for combining data frame but you don't really concat at the base you can also concat by the side you can also concat by, by along the column axis so say um maybe the data of all the customers of your organization now um, say the risk team for instance they have records about the risk profile of these customers and um, the sales team have records about um, the sales transaction and demographics of um, these customers. And you, as the analyst in the organization, it's you desire to um, make use of the data set themselves um, in the two departments. So when you get these two um, data from these two departments, you would ideally want to uh, concatenate it by the side. So, however, you do well to pay attention to um, the alignment of the, the records. Concat works well when the records are aligned in the same way. So, say uh, the first index item in data frame one from department one is the first index item in the data frame one or uh, from, from the um, second department. So we are, what I mean by being the same um, record is, so it's describing the same, maybe you are, you're, you're, we're talking about customers now, so it's describing the same customer. So the same customer that uh, department one have as the first, it's the same customer that department two have as the first, and it goes on till the end of the um, record, um, the data set. Then you can easily, you can easily do a concat and have um, your item made together. So uh, we're not looking deeply into concat here. We're really focusing on merge because uh, most times you'd, um, want to, you might not have data set that is aligned like that. I mean, you think of it as, is, is, is it really, how likely is it that two departments will maintain um, records about all the customers and have it aligned in the same way? It's very, very unlikely. Okay, sorry for the slight break in connection. Okay, so I was talking about having your source of data from two departments, how unlikely it is that the arrangement of customer records will be the same 
between the two departments. So most times what you'd have to do is you have to, you'd have to use um, a, a method that allows you to combine the two, notwithstanding um, whether they've been aligned in one way or the other. So we'll be discussing um, merge, merge method. So I also need to mention that there's also a method called join as well. So join also does something similar to what merge does. So, but we're looking to discuss merge here. So um, we're, for this, for the purpose of this, we're creating two data frames. So we'll create two data frames. I've created them. So this is our data frame one. It has 10 records and two columns. And this data frame two, 10 records and two columns. So, uh, well, we see here that the, the indices match, right? But I, I can easily um, mix up the indices so it looks more realistic. So I'm going to make a slight change to the code here. So I'm going to have it in the reverse order. Yeah. Okay, so let's see it again. So this DF1 index zero to nine and this DF2 index, oh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. So index nine to, All right, so index nine to zero. So we, we're imagine this and now this is our expectation. So this is index nine in data frame one. What we have here is 43 and here is 0 0.462 and this index nine here. So we want the records here to align with the record here and record at eight to align with record at eight here. Record at seven here, so align with record at seven here. Okay, so let's run this. So let's see now. This record at nine, we can see that it is what we expected. So we have 49, 0 0.10. So this has been taken down here to ensure it's, they are aligned properly. So that's the illustration of um concat method okay so we're almost at the end so this is about the final part handling missing data okay so in in real life or in analysis in general it's unlikely that you We'll be given a data set that will have all the um, the cells or the, the record cells filled. So many at times for different reasons, some records may be missing. So some records may be in forms that cannot be interpreted by the uh, by pandas and it returns it as as none. So when you face a such situation and you need to analyze your data, so you need to handle um, these missing values in some ways. So pandas provide some very nice ways to handle these missing values. Uh, so, however, it's important to mention that in handling missing values, it is important that you put some things into consideration. We'll uh, emphasize further on that when we get to, probably that should be two weeks from now when we discuss 
uh, some machine learning models. So, but to give a preview of it. So, if you if you want to handle missing values, so let's take for instance, um, you have you you work in an organization where they have records about customers and um, among the columns of values that you have, you have um, years years of service. You have years of service or years of um, how long the person has been in service. Yeah. So and the in the age column, you now realize that the record, the age um, age of that particular customer is missing. So the best way to fill that age in is to understand that, okay, there is even a column that describes for how long this person has worked. So, and you can see that the person has worked for 30 years, for instance. So it would be counterintuitive to fill the value there with say, maybe zero. That is obviously going to confuse whatever model you're developing because this person is definitely not zero and is definitely not any assumed um, random age. But if you're able to take a peek into the years of um, service, so you could give you an idea. So if somebody has worked for 30 years and you could just safely assume that the person started working at the age of 22, 25, and maybe instead of just filling with random value, you would say, okay, let me say 30 plus 25. And 55 would be a, a better guess than zero or maybe 20. Or So in handling missing data, you need to understand the data you are dealing with to start with. Then sometimes you need to have the domain knowledge. So say you're working in um, real estate firm and um, you have a data set of um, listing of, okay, I, I think this California stuff can also, so, oh, okay, maybe, maybe not this. Okay, maybe not this. So maybe you now you have data of um, houses and their prices and um, maybe number of rooms, number of toilets. And you know, this is about um, houses that are listed. And you now find out that for some, the price is missing. However, it has some features. Like it has some description, like, okay, you know, it's located in, for example, Maitama area in Abuja. It's a, it's a highbrow area. And um, you know, it has, it's a two bedroom bungalow. So, and in the same data set, you have houses that are located in um, Zuba, houses in Guagualada and all sorts. So in such example, you know, okay, how would you fill in such um, record if you don't even have an understanding of the areas in Abuja? So knowing that um, Maitama is highbrow area gives you an idea that, okay, any price I'm filling in here should not be in the range of the prices at Guagualada, Zuba, and all that. It should probably be in the price of Asokoro, um, uh, Muse, and the likes. Or if you, you know, you can relate it to any other, um, any other location for that matter. So having an idea, which is called domain knowledge in, um, in data. Uh, for how long was I out, please? Just a, just a moment ago. Uh, 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I've not said too much. So I was still um, emphasizing on the area, how important, I mean, the domain knowledge, how important it is to understand what data you are dealing with. All right. So um, in data science, 
there, there are some um, well-researched, um, well-discussed approaches to handling missing data. Some of it you can simply fill missing data with um, zero or with any arbitrary value for all, not minding what exists there or what is supposed to exist there. You can simply fill with an arbitrary value. So sometimes, instead of filling with arbitrary value, it can be a value you got from uh, maybe statistically. For instance, you can fill it with mean value. You can fill in with mean value, or you can fill in with median, or maybe the mode. So these are also some informed ways of filling um, uh, non-values. So apart from that, you can also think about um, filling it with um, maybe like, okay, looking at records that are, that are similar to that particular record and using the values in those records to fill it in. So this is actually called um, on, on supervised learning. So you, you do what is called clustering on it and you'd get the values of the records that fall into that cluster and use it to fill in that particular um, re record. So another approach is to also um, use, okay, we'll discuss further on it. I, I don't want to um, go too much into that since we've not even discussed machine learning concepts. So I have said so much about filling, um, handling non-values, and that is because non-values always appear in our uh, analysis, they always appear and they have to be dealt with. So another approach is to use forward view, backward view, or sometimes maybe some extreme situations you drop the non-values. It's usually not advisable because what it means is what if during prediction or during um, live use of your model, such value will occur, how would you handle it? So it's not advisable to feel to drop non-values, but it's also an option. So we'll be considering um, some approaches here. The first one is filling it with a default value, and Pandas provides a nice method, which is a fill now method. So I fill it with zeros. Okay, I beg your pardon, I'm supposed to read in a new data set here. So I'm reading in, um, air quality data sets. As soon as it reads in, we're going to see it display. So we can see it has some non-values here and there. Okay, so the first option is to fill it with zeros. And we see it, we no longer have nans, they've all been filled up. Another option is to fill non-value with the immediate, the next immediate value. So, for instance, here, this non value here, so fill it with what is here. So that's what it does. So forward view. Oh, I beg your pardon. No, instead, it fills it with what precedes it. Sorry. So it fills it with what precedes it. So it basically checks what is before it and fills it. So in this case, there's nothing before this, so it can't be filled. But in this case here, there's 45 right before it, so it's going to fill 45 here. In the next two days, since it has filled this with 45, it can, it will also translate it forward and fill this in with 45 and on and on. However, you know, notice that what if we have 1,000 records of nuns here? So it continues to fill all of them with 45, 45, 45. There's an no element of randomness. It's too predictable and it can mess up our data. So you can set a limit that, okay, maybe don't fill more than five consecutive numbers with none. So it's an argument. It's an argument. Sorry for the noise, please. That was my baby. Okay.
Okay, so you can set the threshold that you don't want it to feel more than a certain number. However, we're not going into any of, we're not um, applying any of those. Um, if you check, if you call help on df.fillnow, on this fillnow method, you're going to see the various ways, um, the various arguments you can pass in. All right, so we have this, and we, we still have none here because there's no number before it to fill forward. So in the next example, in the next example, um, we can do Okay, sorry for the break, please. So here we, we, we have another method of filling na values or nan values. So it's called B fill. So it's basically a backward fill. So it's, it um, fills with what is right before, <coughs> and what is right after it. Sorry, the, uh, the string. Oh, I thought I shared it. You still can't see it. I've shared it. Okay, uh, I, I can't see it. Uh, same here, I can't see it. And it says it's shared here. Okay, maybe it's my network still. Maybe it's my uh, in the connection. Okay, just let me know when you can see it so I can. Uh, uh, it's, it. it's up now. All right. It's up now. All right, all right. Okay, so here we're just changing the F field to B field. So where, whereas F field, which is a forward field, checks if there's a num value, it goes back one step or one index step and picks the value there and transmits it forward and does so for all the num values. In the case of backward field, it checks what is after that value. It checks what is after it and picks the value to fill what is before it. So um, coming back to this, so it checks, picks, there's a none value here. So it checks this 50 and fills it backward here into this none. So we get 50.5 here, we get 25 here. All right, so let's run it and see what we get. Yeah, so we get 50.5 and 5.0 here. All right, however, if you look here, if you look at this part, we have so many nuns still. What it means is, since there is no value after, I mean, after the end of, after the last record, there is no record to pick and fill backward. So we still, we're still going to have some nuns. However, to solve that, we can make use of both forward few and backward few. All right, so um, I call it in a different way here. In place of fill now, you can uh, uh, as well simply call F fill as a method alone, and you can call B fill as a method alone. So I'm calling the two together. So what it does is first it calls, it does this, then after doing that, it does this again, and that solves our problem. So, however, I can assure you that, uh, except you have very few non values that you don't want to care too much about, and maybe the number is insignificant compared to the size of your data, you would not want to use F field and B field to fill your non values. It's much more um, it's much better if you use something like maybe mode, median, or maybe some more advanced uh, methods that um, you will find out. So we have come to the end of today's discussion. Uh, any question? Uh, are there are questions so I can answer before we round up. Nope. Okay. Thank you. So, um, the uh, last weekend, last Sunday, a week ago exactly, um, there was an assignment that was given. So, uh, it's expected to be submitted by tomorrow. So, it's, it will be due by tomorrow. So, if you if your interest um, in this course is to also get certificates at the end of it, so it's advisable you you get this assignment done. So there's going to be another one um, today. So it's going to be sent after the class. 
So we, we, we are going to have at least five assignments and one capstone project, or four assignments and one capstone project. So, and it's expected that everybody who wants to collect a certificate, get a certificate of completion, attempts all the, or complete all the assignments. So the first one is just to, um, we discussed NumPy last week. Um, you'd pick some NumPy um, function uh, methods and um, attributes. So you just go online, maybe go to NumPy uh, documentation or just search about some NumPy methods or something. So just get one, two, three, four, five ideas, then put them together in a simple blog post. It doesn't have to be so complex. It may be your first and it may not be. If it's your first, it's blogging is actually a very good thing for a data scientist, for anybody, because it gives you visibility. Then when you write about something you are learning or something you know, it solidifies what you know about it. Because in writing, you, it's just like when you're teaching as well. It's a different thought. When you, it's, when, you, when you understand something, yeah, internally, you know you understand it. But when you try to explain it or try to, yeah, explain it to somebody or write it down, then you have to bring out a new level of thought that deepens your understanding of it. So it's, you can write it as a medium post. I've shared in some of the emails I sent how you can write a medium post um, or it can be a LinkedIn article. So you have to log into your system, your desktop or your laptop to be able to write a LinkedIn post as well as a medium post. So I'll encourage everybody to get that done, especially if you're interested in um, getting the certificates of completion. All right, so uh, at this point, we can call it a day. Thank you for having me and thank you for signing uh, into the meeting, into the class. And um, do have a lovely evening. Thank you, sir.